Hello and welcome to the empirical risk minimization section. This section is in many ways the heart of the class. Empirical risk minimization is the process by which predictors are learned from data. So many of the predictors that we've seen, in fact many predictors overall, have a parametrized form. We think about y hat is g of x and theta, where g is a function that determines the structure or the form of the predictor. It might be a neural network, or it might be a linear predictor, or it might be a tree. And theta is a set of parameters. It might be a vector or a matrix or some other data structure. And that set of parameters is going to be one of the determinants that produces the output y hat. And when we learn, we're going to learn by choosing the parameters theta, and we're going to leave g fixed. So for example, we might consider linear regression. And if y is scalar, then we'd have y hat would be g theta of x. And here g theta of x would take the form theta 1 times x1 plus theta 2 times x2 all the way up to theta d times xd. And so theta here is a parameter. It's a d-dimensional vector. And we might write y hat is theta transpose multiplied by x. We also might have a predictor for a vector y in Rm. Um, and if that's a linear regression model, then we would have y hat is g theta of x is also theta 1 times x1 plus theta 2 times x2 all the way up to theta d times xd. But here, each of the theta i's is an m-dimensional vector. And the x's, x1 through xd, are the coefficients which determine a linear combination of the vectors theta 1 through theta d. Often we would write that in terms of a matrix. So we'd write our matrix theta, which is a d by m matrix, and the ith row of that matrix is theta i transpose. And then we can express the relationship y hat is g theta of x as y hat is theta transpose times x, just as before. We might have other types of predictors as well. We might have a tree prediction model, in which case theta would encode the tree. It would tell us the thresholds at each of the vertices of the tree and the leaf values. Now we're going to choose which particular theta to use based on some training data. We're going to have n data pairs, x, i, y, i, if i is 1 up to n. And that's going to be the training data. We will use it to fit the model. And this is called the training process. And there's many different training processes that vary based on what kind of predictor we're choosing to fit and what our performance metric is. So for example, if we're training a linear regression model, and if y is scalar, then we might use something like least squares. We would choose theta to minimize the sum over all the data points, i is 1 up to n, of y i minus the predicted value y hat i squared. And this notation y hat i is what it means is g evaluated at x i. So y hat i is the prediction when the predictor is fed with the ith value of x. And as a result, we say, well, we're going to choose theta to minimize the sum of the squares of the prediction error, which is the sum from i is 1 to n of g theta of xi minus yi squared. Now, that's a very reasonable way of learning a predictor. Um, uh, in this lecture, we'll actually cover a, a more general method, which is very widely used, and it's very effective, and uh, it's called empirical risk minimization.
And what it is at its heart is a generalization of the least squares idea. And the way this works is we have a loss function. A loss function takes two vectors as its input, a y hat and a y, and it gives you back a real number. And it quantifies how close y hat is to y. Really what it does is it quantifies how badly y hat approximates y, because normally the loss function of y hat and y is small when y hat is close to y and large when y hat is different from y. Um, so if the loss function is small, we'll say that y hat is really a good approximation of y. And if the loss function is large, we'll say it's a bad approximation of y. And it's very common that we actually arrange things so that the loss function evaluated when y hat is equal to y is zero. And the loss function when y hat is not equal to y is non-negative. So there are some very common examples. The first is uh, the quadratic loss function. If I've got a scalar y and therefore a scalar y hat, the quadratic loss is just y hat minus y squared. If I've got vectors for y and y hat, then the quadratic loss is the two norm or the Euclidean norm of y hat minus y squared, which is just the sum of the squares of the differences between y hat i and y i. Uh, another common loss is the absolute loss. The, if I've got scalar y and scalar y hat again, then the absolute loss is just the absolute value of y hat minus y. Uh, here's another loss. This is the maximum of y hat divided by y minus 1 and y divided by y hat minus 1. So this is the fractional loss or the relative loss. So if y hat is 20% more than y, then y hat over y minus 1 will be 0.2. And uh, if y hat is 20% uh, less than y, then y over y hat minus 1 will be 0.2. Uh, another convenient way of expressing this is as the exponential of the absolute value of the log of y hat minus the log of y minus 1. And often we might scale it by 100, and then it really is a percentage error. Uh, we often use fractional loss for uh, quantities which either range over a very wide range of magnitudes. We saw last time the example of website visits, which can range over many orders of magnitude. Uh, another case where we might use fractional loss is where we're dealing with prices, where very often we're more concerned with the percentage difference in two prices than the absolute difference in two prices. And we'll see some particular interpretations of these losses and cases where some of them are better, more naturally suited than others. And we will also see many other possible loss functions in this class. Now we start off with a loss function and using it we construct something called the empirical risk. And the empirical risk is just the average loss over the data points. So in order to compute the empirical risk we need to have a bunch of data, we need to have a predictor, and we need to have a loss function. And then for each data point, we simply compute the loss between g theta of xi and yi. And then in order to compute the empirical risk, we average that loss over all the data points. And then if the empirical risk is small, the predictor does a good job on average over all the data. 
at least according to the particular loss function that we've chosen. We usually write the empirical risk as a function of the theta that parameterizes the predictor. Of course, it's also a function of the data set, but we suppress that in the notation. And you might say, well, this is quite similar to what we talked about before when we talked about performance metrics. Uh, and that's absolutely true. Um, in both cases, we're measuring how well a predictor does. Um, the difference is, is that performance metric is something that we use to judge how well our predictor is doing. Whereas empirical risk is something that we're going to use to train the model. We're going to train the predictor. We're going to choose which predictor we're going to use according to a procedure which is trying to make the empirical risk small. And very often empirical risk and performance metric are the same and you might say well why not just choose the empirical risk equal to the performance metric. And we're going to have some quite some details to say about that in the, in the rest of this class. Uh, and usually we what we try and do is we try and pick empirical risk to correspond to performance metric. Um, sometimes training works better when you don't do that. Here's, another, here's some more examples of uh, empirical risk. For example, if you've got quadratic loss and scalar y, well then the empirical risk is the mean square error. If you've got scalar y and you're using an absolute loss function, then the empirical risk is the mean absolute error. So let's talk about empirical risk minimization. It's the method according to which we choose theta. And the idea is very simple. Choose theta to minimize the empirical risk. Um, and uh, one way to say that is to say what we're doing with theta is we're trying to make the average loss small over the entire data set. It's a way of getting our predictor to match up with the data set well. Sometimes you can actually solve empirical risk minimization exactly, analytically. Right? So in particular, if g of theta is a linear predictor and uh, we're using a square loss function, then the empirical risk minimization problem is the least squares problem. And that's something that we can solve analytically. There's an explicit formula for the optimal theta. In most cases, it doesn't work like that. In most cases, there is no analytic solution to the minimization problem. There's no formula. And instead, we have to use numerical optimization to find a theta that minimizes the empirical risk. And usually it's actually slightly worse than that in that the numerical procedures that we use cannot guarantee to find the theta that actually minimizes the empirical risk, but instead can only guarantee to approximately minimize the empirical risk. Um, um, but there are also reasons why that's okay. We typically don't want or need a theta that is a perfect minimizer, but an approximate minimizer is fine. And we'll have uh, more to say on that as well. Now the particular value of theta that you get, the particular predictor that you get, depends on the particular loss that you chose. And how are we going to determine which loss we should choose, given that we've seen mean square error, mean absolute error, mean fractional error, and many other potential loss functions. And the answer to these kinds of questions is always the same. We validate. We validate against some external test set. Um, 
And when we do the validation, we don't always validate with the same error measure that we've chosen to train with. We don't validate with the risk, we validate with the performance metric. Now there's one more wrinkle that we add to empirical risk minimization, which it turns out can make it work a lot better. And that is this thing called regularization. And regularization works as follows. We're very concerned when we're training a predictor that we don't overfit the predictor. We don't have a predictor that is tuned very well to features of the training data that aren't features that are generically in the data. In other words, if we take some other data set from the same phenomena, that we want to make sure that our predictor is tuned well to those features that occur in that other data set as well, and not to particular wiggles that only showed up in our training set. The way we do that is we look at the sensitivity of the predictor. We look at its how much it responds to small changes in x. So we would call a predictor d theta insensitive if for some x near x tilde, g theta of x is also near g theta of x tilde. Another way to say it is that if the features are close, then the predictions will also be close. Uh, there are many ways that you can make this more mathematically precise. Um, one is the notion of continuity. Um, and there are other more quantitative notions than continuity as well. Um, but the key point is not so much how you measure the sensitivity of the predictor. It's the benefit you get. By making a predictor which is insensitive to the features x, you make a predictor that generalizes well to your new data set. And that's particularly important when you don't have a lot of training data. So insensitivity is a good attribute for a predictor to have, despite sounding like a bad one. And a regularizer, that's a function of theta that measure, measures how sensitive the predictor g theta is. So the regularizer is a function r. It takes as input theta, and it returns a real number. So here we've used rp to indicate the space in which theta lives as some p-dimensional space. And if y is scalar and we're using a linear predictor, then p is equal to d. If y is m-dimensional and x is d-dimensional, then p is equal to d times m. And if we're using a neural network, then p might be a much larger number. So R theta is chosen such that it's small when g theta is insensitive, and it's large when g theta is sensitive. Um, there are some cases where we can, in a straightforward way, quantify how sensitive a predictor is. Um, so for example, in a linear regression model, where g of theta of x is theta transpose x, then the small sensitivity corresponds to small theta. And the way to see then is to look at what's called the cauchy schwarz inequality. Remember the cauchy schwarz inequality? Let me write it down. 
it says that if I've got two vectors P and Q, and I look at P transpose Q, the absolute value of P transpose Q is less than or equal to the two norm of P multiplied by the two norm of Q. We're going to need a slight generalization of that to, to say the following result. So suppose g theta of x is theta transpose x. And I look at the sensitivity by measuring the norm of the difference between g theta of x and g theta of x tilde. Well, that's equal to the norm of theta transpose multiplied by x minus x tilde. The norm of theta transpose x minus x tilde is less than or equal to the norm of theta multiplied by the norm of x minus x tilde. Now the tricky thing here is the choice of norm that we use for that inequality. Um, and first of all, let me uh, remind you of the result we're using. First of all, theta transpose times a vector x the absolute value is less than or equal to the norm of theta, two norm, times the norm of x in the two norm. Now, this is true when both theta and x are vectors. So here we've got theta is in Rd and x is in Rd. Now, I want to also consider the case where y is not a scalar, but y is a vector. And then we must look at what happens when we multiply a matrix times a vector and ask if there's a simple way of constructing a bound on that quantity. So here, let's consider a matrix A and look at the two norm of the matrix A times the, the vector x. And we, can, we know what that is. That's the sum over i is 1 up to m of a i transpose x squared. I'm going to make that squared. Where well, here, what I've done is I've written a in terms of its rows, a1 transpose up to a m transpose. So each little a i here is a vector in R d, and a here is a matrix in R m by d. Now this quantity here, a i transpose x, well we know how to bound that, because that comes from the straightforward cauchy schwarz inequality. So this is less than or equal to the sum of i is 1 up to m of the norm of a i, 2 norm squared, the norm of x, 2 norm squared, using the square of the cauchy schwarz inequality. Now, of course, we can put parentheses around that because the x doesn't depend on i. And this, this quantity here is the sum of the norm squares of each of the col of each of the rows of the matrix A. In each row of a matrix A, we can calculate its norm squared by taking the sum of the squares of its entries. And then if we sum over all the rows, what we've effectively done is taken the sum of the squares of all of the entries of A. So that's equal to the sum over i, 1 up to m, the sum over j is 1 up to d of the norm of a i j, and it's not the norm of a i j, of a i j squared, multiplied by the norm of x squared, and this quantity is known as 
the Frobenius norm squared of a matrix. And it's the analog of the Euclidean norm of a vector. It just takes the sum of the squares of all of the entries of the matrix A and square roots them. So we can apply that result to our predictor, our vector predictor, and we find that the norm of theta transpose x minus x tilde is less than or equal to the Frobenius norm of f multiplied by the norm of x minus x tilde. And this suggests that, well, maybe we should use as a regularizer the norm of theta squared in the Frobenius norm. And that is one possible choice, and it's a very common choice for a regularizer. If we keep the regularizer small, we choose a theta that makes R of theta small, then we will make our predictor less sensitive to x. Now, when y is scalar, the most common regularizer to use is simply the sum of the squares of the components of theta, the two norm of theta squared. That has a name that's called ridge regularization. For vector y, we take the sum of the squares of all of the entries of the matrix theta, the Frobenius norm of theta squared. And that's also called a ridge regularization. Another very popular regularizer is to take the one norm of theta when theta is a vector, that's the sum of the absolute values of the entries of theta. And when theta is a matrix instead of a vector, we take the sum over all of the entries of theta. We take the, the sum of the absolute values of all of the entries of theta. Now, when there is a constant feature, for example, when x1 is 1, um, then we do something slightly different when we're doing regularization. This often happens because we very often would like to have a predictor with a constant term in it. So for example, if g theta is a linear predictor, then g theta of x is theta transpose x and if uh, x1 is chosen to be 1, then g theta of x will be theta1 plus theta2 transpose times the remaining components of x. Uh, we also do this when we have neural network predictors. In the general matrix case, g theta of x will look like theta transpose x, but now the first component which corresponds to x1 is 1 will be the first row of theta. Here we've written that as theta 1 comma colon. And so the resulting predictor will be g theta of x is theta 1 comma colon transpose plus theta 2 colon d comma colon transpose x2 colon d. Here, let's be explicit about what the notation means. The notation here means the following. If I have a two, three, comma, four, seven, that means take a slice out of the matrix, which consists of the second and third rows and the columns four, five, six, and seven. I can also write things like this a 2 colon 3 comma colon, which means take the entire second and third rows in every column. Uh, and this is notation that's used by MATLAB and Julia and is also now spread its way back from programming into mathematics. Um, so g theta of x is constant plus a linear term in x. Now the constant terms don't affect the sensitivity. We can see this if we evaluate g theta of x minus g theta of x tilde, then we get the constant terms simply cancelling out. And we're left with 
the theta 2 colon d transpose multiplied by x minus x tilde. And as a result, there's no need to regularize the first row of theta if x1 is constant. And we use a regularizer, which is simply a norm or some other function of the remaining entries of theta. And uh, we might use the Frobenius norm squared of the last d minus 1 rows of theta. And that brings us to regularized ERM. That's a method where we, instead of choosing a, th a theta that simply mi minimizes the empirical risk, L of theta, we also try to find a theta that trades off the insensitivity of the predictor. And the way it does that is we find, try to find a theta which makes both L of theta small and R of theta small. The way you do that is via, is via a technique called regularized ERM, where we choose theta to minimize the weighted sum L of theta plus lambda times R of theta. Lambda here is a non-negative number. It's a parameter. It's called the regularization hyperparameter. Um, and hyperparameter here means that instead of it being a parameter that's learned from the training data directly, it's a parameter we're going to choose via a different process, which I will tell you about in a second. Now, when lambda is zero, regularized ERM just reduces to ERM. When lambda is very large, then theta that minimizes L of theta plus lambda R of theta is going to be very close to the theta that just minimizes R of theta. And so we're going to end up with a predictor which is very insensitive, but may not do very well at fitting the predicted data. And so when lambda takes intermediate values between zero and very large, well, then we're going to get some balance between minimizing L of theta and minimizing R of theta. And in most cases, you cannot solve regularized DRM exactly, just as you can't so solve ERM exactly. And so we use numerical optimization. So with ERM, you're just minimizing the empirical risk L of theta, and you're choosing the theta that does that. With RERM, because you are adding on this term to the objective function, lambda times R of theta, the theta that you get does not minimize the empirical risk. In other words, it's not producing the predictor that best fits the training data. It's producing a predictor that fits the training data worse than the ERM predictor. But it is less sensitive than the ERM predictor because the, what you gain is you get a predictor that's making the regularizer small. Now the benefit here is that a predictor that's less sensitive often generalizes better. It makes better predictions on unseen data than the predictor that fits the training data as well as possible. And this is what you see in practice, is that even though there's, there's a predictor, which is the ERM predictor, that does the best on the training data, that predictor, when you take it and try it on unseen data, it's not the best predictor. And you get a better predictor on unseen data by finding a predictor which solves the RERM minimization problem, which backs off a little bit from fitting the data as well as possible and instead compromises and chooses a, a, a theta which is less sensitive. We still have to say, how do we choose these things? How do we choose the regularizer and how do we choose the regularization parameter, lambda? And ultimately, the answer is the same for all of these questions. Use validation. You have a performance metric. Look at the predictor that you got and try it out 
on some unseen data and see how well it does. Pick the one that does the best. Uh, for Lambda in particular, there's a very specific technique called regularization hyperparameter search. And that's for choosing Lambda. And the way this works is that you choose a set of values of Lambda, say 50, between, say, 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the 5, and usually logarithmically spaced. Um, and uh, uh, for each one of those lambda values, you solve the RERM problem. You minimize L of theta plus lambda times R of theta. Now, for each lambda value, you're going to get a different theta. You're going to get a different predictor. And so theta, you get a bunch of different theta values, 50 different theta values, 50 different theta vectors. And that's called the regularization path. Now, with each of those 50 different theta values, we have a corresponding predictor, and we can evaluate the performance of those predictors on the test set. And what we do is we choose the value of lambda that gives the best test performance, and the corresponding predictor is the one we use. Now, there's a particular case for which we can solve ERM and RERM exactly. And those are called least squares and ridge regression. And I'm going to review least squares and then tell you about ridge regression. So when we have uh, a square loss and a linear predictor, we can solve the ERM problem explicitly, exactly, analytically. We have a predictor g theta of x is theta transpose x. We have data consisting of n pairs xi, yi. Now the empirical risk is the average of the loss of the predictor evaluated at each of the data points compared with, so the loss is evaluated at a prediction value theta transpose xi and the true yi at that point. Now, in our case, the loss is just quadratic. And so this is theta transpose xi minus yi squared. And if y is a vector, then this should really be the norm. L of theta should be 1 on n. The sum from i is 1 up to n of the norm of theta transpose xi minus yi squared. Now we're going to express this in a convenient matrix form as the Frobenius norm of x theta minus y squared divided by n. To do this, we will construct two matrices, x and y. x is an n by d matrix whose ith row is the ith feature vector, xi transposed. And y is an n by m matrix whose ith row is the ith target vector, yi transposed. Now, when we look at this expression, x theta minus y, that's a matrix. Its first row is simply x1 transposed theta minus y1 transposed. x second row is x2 transposed theta minus y2 transposed, and so on. Now, the norm squared of the prediction error, the, so the loss, at the first data point is the norm squared of that row. And that's just the sum of the squares of the entries in the row. I'd like to compute the empirical risk. In order to do that, I've got to sum up all of the different norm squares, all of the different losses, and divide them by n. So that's just the sum of the squares of all of the entries in this matrix divided by n. And that's 1 on n times the Frobenius norm.
of that matrix squared. And now I've got to choose the theta that minimizes that quantity. Now, let's do a quick review of least squares. Suppose I had this problem, minimize the norm of x, w, minus v squared. That's a least squares problem, and here w and v are vectors. What's the solution to this? Well, we've seen this before in our linear algebra class. The, the optimal solution is x transpose x inverse x transpose v. We're minimizing over w. And we can get this by expanding this norm and differentiating, for example. Now, suppose I want to solve our more complicated problem, x theta minus y for Benius norm squared, where theta is now a matrix, I can do that by writing theta in terms of its columns, w1, w2, up to wm, and y in terms of its columns, y1, y2, up to ym. And then the ith column of x theta minus y is simply x wi minus yi. Now the Frobenius norm squared of a matrix is the sum of the squares of the, of the Euclidean norm of the columns. So this quantity is the sum over i is 1 up to m of the norm of x wi minus yi squared. Now I've got to minimize this quantity and I'm minimizing it by choosing the wi's. Now this is a, a sum with m terms and the ith term in this sum only depends on wi. And so in order to minimize this sum, I choose the w1 to minimize the first term, the w2 to minimize the second term, and so on. Each one of those minimizers looks like this. It's a least squares problem, and so the answer to that individual least squares problem looks like that. And that means that when I stack all these columns next to each other, I find that W is X transpose X inverse X transpose Y. And so we can solve a matrix least squares problem in the Frobenius norm by solving M separate least squares problems. And it turns out that the matrix inside each of those least squares problems is the same. It's simply x transpose x inverse x transpose. So I just need to solve that once, multiply it by y, and that will give me all of the w's at once, which is the matrix w that I wanted. I guess I called that matrix theta rather than w. Let's call it theta. So that gives us the minimizing theta, x dagger times y, which is just x transpose x inverse x transpose y. This is called least squares regression. Now, if we're doing regularized ERM, and we've got a regularizer, which is the norm squared of theta, and we've got square loss as in our loss function, and we've got a linear predictor, then we can solve our ERM exactly as well. And this is called ridge regression. The R ERM objective function is just like our ERM objective function with one extra term. 
the extra term being lambda times the norm of theta squared, where the norm is the Frobenius norm. And so the overall objective has two terms, both of which are matrix norms in theta. Now, I can express this in a convenient way. I can stack up my two expressions, my two different norm expressions, to make one norm expression. Now, in order to uh, make sense of this expression here, we will notice the following things. First of all, if I've got two matrices A, B, multiplied by theta, that just works out to be A theta, B theta. And the second is that if I'm looking at the norm of A theta, B theta, and that's the Frobenius norm squared, well, that's just the sum of the squares of the entries of the matrix. So I can break that up very conveniently as the norm of A theta F squared plus the norm of B theta F squared. And if I use those two facts, I can see that this is going to have, this product here is going to be X theta minus Y in the top block and the bottom block is going to be root n lambda theta. And then I'm going to take the norm squared of both of those blocks separately and end up with my expression for the objective function of regularized ERM. Now, this problem is precisely of the form that we had for ERM. It's just got a larger matrix here and a larger matrix here. And remember that in the ERM problem, when I was trying to solve the minimum over theta of the norm of A theta minus B for Benius norm squared, there was an explicit answer, which was theta is equal to A transpose A inverse A transpose B. B. So here I simply need to compute this matrix x on top of root n lambda identity transposed times itself inversed times the same matrix again times the B matrix which is y0 and that works out to be this expression here for the optimal theta. And just to see that, if I work out x root n lambda identity transpose x root n lambda identity, I get x transpose x plus n lambda identity. Now, when lambda is greater than zero, it so happens that this inverse always exists. I don't need the usual assumption that the columns of X are linearly independent. And so we can explicitly solve ridge regression in the case where, which is RERM in the case where we've got a quadratic loss, quadratic regularizer, and a linear predictor. Uh, we can, here's a, a, a Julia implementation. Um, you give it a matrix X and a matrix Y, and it will return for you the corresponding theta matrix. Here is the case where we don't regularize the first row of theta. Uh, the only thing it changes is that we multiply theta inside the regularization term by E, where E is a matrix which has zero for its first column and is a D minus one by D minus one identity 
for its remaining columns. And therefore e times theta simply picks out the last d minus 1 rows of theta. As a result, the norm of e theta squared is precisely the norm that we wanted, the norm of the last d minus 1 rows of theta. That translates, just as before, into uh, uh, this larger matrix expression. And when I take the product of this matrix transpose times itself, I get the extra term right there, E transpose E. E transpose E, it's a matrix which is square and has an, a d minus 1 by d minus 1 identity in the lower right block and in the top left block it just has a 0 instead of a 1. So it's an identity matrix which is just missing one of its 1's. And here's a Julia implementation of that case as well. Notice that when we write in Julia the code looks very like the mathematics. That's a, a very convenient feature. The only perhaps slight difference here is that there's this nice backslash function in Julia which is a, a convenient shorthand for the explicitly square solution that we've seen before. So a backslash b means a transpose a inverse a transpose b. At least in the case where a is skinny and full rank, that's exactly what it means. Now let's look at a, a, an example of how this works in practice. Uh, this is a, a data set for uh, 442 individuals of which has been measured 10 different indicators for diabetes. And those are our 10 components of U. And X will have 11 components because we will have a constant feature added on. Now the target variable, the Y, is simply a scalar and that's some measure of diabetes progression over one year. There's some biological indicator of that. And that's on the vertical axis in these plots. And on the horizontal axis in each one of these plots is a different component of U. So the first one here is age. We can see individuals between age 20 and age 80. And some spread over the resulting diabetes indicators. The second one is sex. And those have been labeled here as 1 or 2 which is a particular choice of embedding for the two possible values in this data set. Uh, we have BMI, body mass indicator. BP is blood pressure. And then we have S1 through S6, which are particular blood serum levels. So we've got this data, and we're going to try and fit it using ERM and RERM. We'll take the data and we'll split it 80-20, so we'll use 80% of it for training and 20% of it we'll use as validation data which we're using which we're going using the and we will use the validation data to choose the hyperparameter lambda. We'll use lambda values between 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the 4. Here we look at two plots. The first plot is a plot of the empirical risk of the optimal theta as we vary lambda. So remember what the approach is here. We've got lambda values varying between 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the 4. And we've got, say, 50 different values. For each one of those lambda values, we minimize L of theta plus lambda times R of theta. We get a theta for each one of those lambda values. And 
For each one of those thetas, we can compute the empirical risk on the training data set. That's this plot right here. Uh, something to notice is when lambda is very small, right down here, we've got a theta that is effectively minimizing empirical risk. And as we increase lambda, well then we're starting to trade off and instead of minimizing just empirical risk, we're starting to balance out sensitivity. We can also look at the corresponding R values, the regularizer values. And you can see they go the opposite way. When lambda is very small, the minimizer makes no effort to make R of theta small, and R of theta is just whatever it happens to be. As we increase lambda, well, suddenly the minimizer is compelled to minimize R of theta instead of minimizing L of theta. And when we get over here, we've got R of theta is zero. Remember, that's the sum of the squares of the entries of the matrix of, of theta, which means we've got a predictor which is completely zero. So the predictor is not doing anything. It's completely insensitive to the data. So at this end, when lambda is very large, we end up with zero predictors, predictors which are constant. They still have the constant term in there, but the rest, the, the last d minus one columns of theta are zero. And at this end, at the other end of the, of the lambdas, we end up with predictors which minimize the empirical risk. As we increase lambda, the empirical risk increases, so the fit gets worse, but the sensitivity decreases, so the regularizer gets smaller. Now, for each value of lambda, we have a theta. Theta here is predicting a scalar y from 11 components of x. Remember, we've got 10 measured variables and a constant feature. And uh, so theta is just 11 numbers. It's a 11-dimensional vector. And so we can plot those 11 numbers as we vary lambda. And what you can see is that when lambda is very small, they have some particular values. And then as we move to the right and increase lambda, the components of theta start to get smaller. And eventually we end up with all of theta, zero, as we know. And the model parameters generally get smaller because the, the regularized empirical risk minimization is starting to focus on minimizing R of theta, which is the same as minimizing the norm squared of theta. People call regularization shrinkage because of this phenomenon. Now this is the important plot. Here we have two performance plots. We're looking at mean square error on the training data, that's the blue plot, and on the test data, that's the red plot, as we vary lambda. Remember we've got 50 different values of lambda, each one, for each one of those we have a predictor that predictor, we can measure its performance in two ways. Once we can measure it on the training set, and what, the other time we can measure it on the validation set, the test set. Now, we already know what happens on the training set. As we increase lambda, the training error the empirical risk measured on the training set increases. But look what happens on the test set. As we increase lambda, well, yes, we are naturally increasing the training error. 
But because the predictor generalizes better, because the predictor is less sensitive, it does better on the test set. At some point, we get past the point where we've traded off too much performance. And we're making a predictor that's very insensitive, but so insensitive that it doesn't bother looking at the data and doesn't bother making a good prediction. This is the benefit. This is why we do regularization right here in this plot. It's for this dip there, which is where we see the regularized ERM doing better than the unregularized ERM over here on the validation data, which is unseen data, which wasn't used to generate the predictor. And as a result, we might say, pick a value for theta. Now we could say, let's pick a value for theta at exactly this minimum. Some people do that, although actually you're often better off by predicting a value of theta, picking a value of theta which is a little bit to the right, a little bit more insensitive than the minimizer. As a result, we get a little bit extra insensitivity. Here we're only just testing it on one validation set data set. We might like to be a little bit sure that it's going to generalize when we see multiple unseen data sets. And so we put a little bit of extra unsensitivity in it. So we might choose lambda to be 0.3 or even 1 for this data set. And um, here we see regularization. It's improved the performance, not by a great deal in this example. It went from 0.63 down to 0.58 or something like that. Sometimes the benefits are much more dramatic. And uh, uh, that depends on the characteristics of the data and how much data you have and whether your particular structure of your predictor is prone to overfitting that data. And some, so sometimes regularization is massively important and uh, an unregularized predictor, an ERM predictor, will not work at all, whereas a regularized predictor can work very well. To summarize, empirical risk is a function of the parameter theta that measures the fit on the training data set. It is often but not always the same as the performance metric. ERM chooses theta to minimize empirical risk on the training data set. Regularized ERM doesn't. Regular ER regularized ERM chooses theta as a trade-off between two different objectives. The first being small empirical risk i.e. a good fit on the training data, and the second being predictor insensitivity. We choose the loss function and the regularizer function by validation using our performance metric. We choose lambda by validation. Now when we have quadratic loss, quadratic regularization, and a linear predictor, we can find the optimal parameters using least squares. And that's either called least squares regression when it's unregularized, or it's called ridge regression when it's regularized. In general, for ERM, when we don't have quadratic loss, or we don't have quadratic regularizers, or we've got complicated predictors, we have to use numerical optimization. We're going to cover this in detail later in the course.